So we're going to be talking about codependency and overcoming narcissistic abuse. Have most of you been in narcissistically abusive relationships? Adulthood or childhood ones or both? both. Okie dokie, standard, fairly standard. Anybody in an adult relationship that wasn't in a childhood issue? Well, there's no problem with the parents? Okay, ish. <laughs> Who's got no problem with their parents? <laughs> I was like, hmm. <laughs> that's a tough one. I was walking around before and I was thinking, there's not many people who would be saying that they've got no problems at all with the mum and dad. It's not an easy job. It doesn't seem to be an easy task to do. Um, you've all heard of the concept of the good enough mother, the good enough father. Nobody's expecting perfection, but any too much deviation outside of those lines seems to create a disproportionate amount of trouble. Feel free to come and sit at the front where there's four chairs. <laughs> when you're very young and you're very sensitive, these things, they leave marks. You, there's a concept in neurology called neuroplasticity. When we're very young, our neuroplasticity is at its height. We slowly get harder and stiffer and crustier until about the age of 21 to 25. And then a lot of the neuroplasticity disappears, which is annoying for me in my job because at the time when you're most susceptible to change, that's when you can't, you have no boundaries and you can't say no. And so where the trauma goes in, it goes in deeply. And then you show up at the age you are now. And I really need that neuroplasticity back and we don't have it. We tend to remain non-neuroplastic, but it is required. It is required. If you're looking to make changes, the only changes that are ever gonna stick have to be at the level of neural pathways. They really do. They have to be at the level of the unconscious. Everything else is too cosmetic. It's not gonna work. So what does that mean? It means you have to take large dosages of psychedelics or no, <laughs> you'll never get better. I think, I think the reason why psychedelics and MDMA is becoming really popular in therapy now is just for the neuroplasticity, that's it. But we don't need drugs for neuroplasticity. We do need to be willing to change. And um, some of the issues that we're talking about tonight are around beliefs. So we have beliefs that are very, very much locked in place. And you will find that sometimes you'd say like, oh, I just don't want to get into a narcissistic abusive relationship again. And you'll find that there are certain beliefs that you hold dear to you that you probably do need to let go of. You can grab one of these chairs. It's okay. okay. Yeah. Come in. Come into the circle. We're going to start drumming and chanting soon. And then the ayahuasca brew will be mixed up and delivered by this man. <laughs> the shaman is here. And then I'll sing. And then you will all know trauma. Deep, <laughs> deep, lasting trauma. Anybody got any questions before I go into what I'm going into? Oh, what a quiet and shy group you are. How wonderful. What are we, what are we talking about? <laughs> codependency. Um, codependency and overcoming narcissistic abuse. So in this context, when we're talking about codependency, obviously it's a little bit of a, it's not quite the right word for it. We could be talking about the fawn response. We could call ourselves echoes, where the echo to narcissus. We could say we are people pleasers. And we could say that we're neurotically adverse to confrontation in certain contexts. Yes? Yes. So whilst you might be able to say no in most areas, if you are classifying yourself as codependent, you come to a talk like this, it's because there's certain people or certain contexts in which you cannot say no. Where when you are in that context, your unconscious default behavioral response becomes to submit and to please. This is best and easiest. Like if we, I was trying to read some psychoanalytic theory yesterday. I'm not proud of it, but it happened. And uh, it's the language that is used is just horrendous. So I'm going to try and not use jargon as much as possible, but it is, it is difficult. What happens under these circumstances? Like, I think the easiest way to say it is it's a master slave dynamic. So if you're raised in an environment with parents who are bigger than you physically, and all of you were raised in, in that environment, if you can imagine and go back to childhood for a second and try and remember or imagine what that was like when you are, your head is smaller than all the adults' knees. 
So you're surrounded by giants, basically. And two of those giants hold the power of life and death over you. Even if they don't threaten your life, you know unconsciously that they do because they're providing shelter and they're providing food. Now, if all of us, for some weird science fiction fantasy scenario, we're in a situation where we're in a camp and we're dependent on our survival on giants, that would be weird, right? That would change the power dynamic. Like I'm gonna to speak to a giant in a certain way that I wouldn't speak to you because I'm gonna be careful because I don't wanna get stamp stamped on. Add to the fact that you have no boundaries. You can't leave. Like all of you have debit and credit cards and Uber. You could just be like, fuck this seminar, I'm going home or I'll go to the bar. You couldn't leave. That wasn't even an option. You couldn't even dream of leaving. Well, when you get to three and four years old, you do dream of leaving. You pack your bags and you say, oh, I'm off to go and explore the world. And you know, you run around the garden and you come back. But before that, you couldn't even think of it. It wasn't even an option. So in this area where we're trying to deal with this and we don't want cosmetic solutions, we want to uproot the problem by the roots. So it's gone so that you can get on with your lives and not have to come to seminars like this again. We do have to delve into the areas that are most explored by psychoanal uh, psychoanalytic theory and psychoanalysts. There's no real avoiding that. So we are in the realm of the unconscious here. The master-slave dynamic plays out because mummy and daddy didn't always have time for your nonsense. And you had nonsense because you were a child. And so you're making noise all the time. You're demanding things all the time. You're wetting yourself. It's a stressful scenario to be in for an, for an adult, for the parent. So how did your parents deal with that stress? Some parents would have dealt with that with irritation and rage. Some parents control their children via shaming and guilting. Some parents just ignore their kids. Some parents actually hit their kids. Some parents have sex with their children and so on and so on. All of these things leave marks and those marks, they're there in the system. They're there in the unconscious because of the neuroplasticity. It's like a, a ball of plasticine that's very, very soft. You put your thumb into it and there is a thumbprint there. Once it gets cold and hard, you put your thumb into it, there's no thumbprint there. So the neuroplasticity becomes a very, very big issue. So if we're entrained, ha ha, you're late. <laughs> there's, there's, two, there's two seats here. <laughs> well, we all have our cross to bear. <laughs> Did you drive from London? Yes. Oh my God. Well, well done. Four hours. Four hours. Good Lord, have mercy upon you. That's not a pleasant drive either. I've done it loads, it's awful. So what becomes entrained into us then is like this master-slave dynamic that isn't based on mutual respect, negotiation, and safe attachment. So that's not what we're used to. Now I think if we're gonna be real about CPTSD and abuse, by the strictest definitions that would please a psychoanalyst or a mental health practitioner, everybody experienced abuse everybody was abused by the standards of, you know, do goody, 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 two shoes, psycho psychologists like, you can't say that to a child, you can't do that to a child. Everybody's experienced abuse to a degree. So everybody is effectively traumatized. The only difference between the people in this room and any hundred people that we could grab at random is that you know you are, you know you are, but everybody else you see out there muttering to themselves and twitching and, you know, carrying on and doing whatever they're doing. I'm not fucking traumatized. <laughs> they are, they are, our politicians are traumatized. It's all over their faces. You know, the people who are governing us, it's, they are traumatized. So trauma in that sense carves the world into the shape that it is. We are traumatized people living in a world built by traumatized people. So what's the solution to this? I think if we want to alter this master-slave dynamic that we're entrained into, the first thing is we have to admit it. There has to be a degree of, Jocko Willink calls it extreme ownership. It's otherwise known as radical acceptance by somebody. Marsha. Who? Marsha That's very good. Lollipop for you later. <laughs> Marsha, Marsha Linehan, yeah. Uh, radical acceptance. And that's not easy because the radical acceptance that 
we were abused, we are traumatized, and many of our most deeply held precious beliefs about the world and about love and about other people are simply wrong, is a, a heavy confrontation for the ego ideal. Hiya. Just grab one of these. There's a chair right there. Go on, please. Sit, sit right at the front. <laughs> sit right at the front. <laughs> you, can, you can tell your therapist about this later this week. Then he made me sit at the front. Um, so, so yeah, it's, uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry for moving. <laughs> I'm going to wait till you sit down, then I'm going to move forwards and backwards. I'm going to stay standing up. Good, the rest good. Of it. Then there'll be, there'll be less trauma for you. Um, so that's hard. And I actually think, you know, with those of you who are keeping up with the, with, with the work that I'm doing, as it progresses, we have to be in the realm of philosophy. I was saying we have to be in the realm of philosophy. You've got to reconsider your whole world view, like the very foundations by which you do reality. Because if you have in the foundation a piece of source code that says, when I love someone, context and person, remember this, context and person, when I love someone, when I live with somebody, when I'm role playing mummy and daddy, when I'm playing house, which is what we're all doing in our relationships, we're playing house, trying to figure it out as we go, but we're acting like we know what the fuck we're doing. We don't. I must do what they say. Everything else is fine, but you have that one piece of code, that one rogue piece of code running, your relationships won't work. They can't work because over a long enough timeline, all of these little bits and pieces grow and become bigger and bigger and bigger. And let's face it, we don't just have one rogue piece of source code running here. We have multiple rogue pieces of source code running here. Would that piece of code relate to subconscious fear of abandonment? There's the unconscious fear of abandonment. And then for people who identify as codependents, what we have to look at is that many of the ways we're interacting with other people. So codependency and fawning is something you do. It's like, it's, um, is it a personality disorder? I would say no. It's actually just an entrained pattern of behavior. It's like, uh, it's a post-traumatic stress response, effectively. Attachment. Yeah, kind of. Um, uh, so it is, it, it's effectively like an attachment trauma. So you're fearing the abandonment which you experienced in childhood because mommy and daddy didn't really give you, they didn't let you form. They didn't let you attach. They're supposed to let you attach, detach and individuate. If any of that process gets damaged, it's not good. It's really, really not good. So there's the fear of abandonment and then there is fear of negative emotion in ourselves and in others. Because if you were raised in an environment where you didn't feel safe, Whenever there was a negative emotion like uh, anger, anxiety, irritation, fear, it could lead to something catastrophic, or at least you felt it would because you didn't feel loved. So you're like, well, I'm not safe here. So I don't know if the result of mummy and daddy having an argument is that I end up in an orphanage like Oliver Twist, which that's where we start talking about most, of you know, what catastrophic thinking is. That's like a catastrophic thinking style. How rational was that belief? Well, you might be able to laugh at it now and say it wasn't very likely, but how did the how is the child supposed to know what can happen? What The child doesn't have any reference experiences. You're just a fucking child. You don't know anything. So you don't know that the end result of two people arguing is that you don't end up in an orphanage. Some kids do. Some kids do. They go into social care. That actually is a, is a thing that happens. You won't be able to sort of reason and say, well, no, because mom and dad would be too embarrassed, even if they don't really love each other, the social pressure to stay together is gonna to be such and the financial, con you can't fucking do that when you're four. You just go, this is really bad. This is life-threateningly bad. So the amount of stress you're experiencing is uh, so intense and so high, it moves beyond stress and into trauma. So if the stress, things are warping a little bit, trauma is when things break. So there's actual breaks that have occurred. And if there's enough adrenaline, you'll experience a total break. If there's enough fear, enough terror, you'll start to experience total psychotic breaks. And then you'll be forced to find a way of coping with that, which will be fight, flight, fawn, or freeze. But what's the first one that we do? The first one in evolution is mammals. And the first option that we have as children is freezing, is freezing. That's everybody's primal, primal, primal response. 
because if you think about it in evolutionary terms as animals, when faced with a threat, the quickest and smartest thing to do is to keep still. If you don't know, within the first microseconds of a threat appearing as you keep still, and as a child, you can't fawn, you can't negotiate, and you can't fight because you're too small and you don't have the boxing skills yet. You'll get them though. What does fawning mean? When you fawn, you're seeking to, you're basically negotiating. You're trying to trade. You're trying to trade with the uh, oppressor. There's actually a physical response that animals have, that some animals have with the fawn response, which is you've, this is pretty gross, but you've probably heard of, of the idea that when there's a sudden release of adrenaline, you might want to throw up or you might want to go to the bathroom. Yeah. And one of the theories is that that could be so the predator has something to eat other than you. So yeah, so you would actually, like when a lizard drops its tail, it's like, eat that, don't eat me. So the fawning response is codependency. So we're saying, if we're diehard codependents, we're saying, don't eat me, eat this false self. But if you're saying, don't eat me, predator, which is now mother or father, eat this false self, and then we do that over and over and over again, you just become a false self. You live as a false self. Die-hard codependents are not really alive. We're not really alive because we're not really here. The real us is like hiding somewhere away and we just show up as a, like an avatar. The point of which is to keep us safe, to keep the real person safe. We just have a fake version of ourselves that we push out to the world. The problem with that unfortunately, is it fits hand in glove with the narcissist false self. So we're acting like the ultimate prey. Don't eat me, don't kill me, there's no point, I'm not worth it, eat this instead. The narcissist is also role-playing being the ultimate predator. They're both false, they're both fantasies, it's total fantasy. But these two fantasies enmesh perfectly. And then you'll have narcissistically abusive relationships that make no fucking sense whatsoever, that go on and on and on for years, and you'll be like, why am I doing this? you're not really doing it. Not really. What you're doing is you're like, it's like playing a, a computer game and you're controlling that sort of version of yourself and they're controlling that version of themselves. And then there's this interrelationship that's going on, but there's no adults there. There's no people there. Is this a virtual survival relationship that the two people are subconsciously participating in? It's kind of like that. Is it about survival? It's definitely a virtual relationship taking place between two avatars. And let me just add to that, with late stage consumer capitalism and the culture we're living in now, everybody's doing it now. Uh, like, you will, you're only on a spectrum of how much you're doing it because it ain't safe. It's not safe to show up in this environment as, as your authentic self. It's way easier. Social media rewards it. Social media entrains you to be an avatar of yourself. That's the point of the icons. We turn ourselves into icons. We have likes, follows, timelines, and stories. Emojis. Emojis. So none of this is about authenticity. This is about killing vulnerability. So I'm not vulnerable. Okay, you're not vulnerable. Wonderful, well done. You won that game. Now you're not authentic. Ah, now you're complaining there's no love. How can there be? How can there be between two avatars, between two plasticine avatars bumping up against each other? Of course, there's no fucking love, but you'll get little bursts of emotion and then you'll call that love. You go, oh, I felt something. Ah, 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 ah. It's not fucking love. That's like terrorism. It's, it's, it's torture. I mean, if, if you're being tortured and then the torturer says, I'm going to torture you less today and you go, oh, that's, that's so romantic. Thank you so much. You're going to leave some of my fingernails in. You are a love. And then you say that's love. And you get attached to that person based on these, this weird sort of push-pull pain pleasure dynamic uh, that then just leads to trauma bonding. In that sense, trauma bonding, what we would usually say, trauma bonding is a concept from psychology of cults. So you bring the person into the cult, you love bomb them, then you accuse them of some terrible sin at some point. You lock them up in a cupboard and then you free them. But if I'm the one who locks you up in the cupboard and the one who frees you, I am both angel and devil. And that trauma repeated again and again forces you to split. Not that you become schizophrenic, but you have a schizophrenic view of who I am. All of you have been in narcissistically abusive relationships, all have a schizophrenic view of your partner, good and evil. Who do you get back with? The good one. 
No, you don't understand, Richie. You had a difficult childhood. <laughs> Wait, this time is the real time. Okay. <laughs> See you at the next seminar. Um, we've all done it. I've done it. I've done it multiple times. And the, the hope is, I think, the malignant optimism, this evil hope, is that there'll be a resolution through these plasticine avatars. This can never be a resolution there. There's no resolution there. It's a game. It's a game without end. And I would even say to people, like, I don't want to take the game away from them because I think some people like it. It's like being addicted to Coke or something. You know, it's very intense. Normal love doesn't feel like that. Well, because of normal love. Love doesn't feel like that and can't feel like that because love isn't being terrorized and tortured. You're like, oh, this is boring, all this affection and kindness. Mm. Yeah, of course. Because you're used to torture, you're used to being terrorized, you're used to being terrified, which is a very emotionally intense experience. People come to me and they go, why is the sex so good? I'm like, well, why do you fucking think? Why do you think the sex is so good? Why do you think you're being manipulated in this way? Why do you think you're being trauma bonded in this way? Why do you hold that person in this kind of regard? I see a lot of quizzical looks on your faces. What I'm actually saying to you, I don't know you all personally. But if you are a diehard codependent, you've never known love. It's not possible. And you've never loved anyone. Not really. The only way you would have known love is if you've had kids, is my hypothesis. If you've had children or you, or you know children, then you can. Then you will let yourself do it. But with adults, I don't think, I don't think you ever would have done it. Why is the sex so good? It comes from a, a very dark place of domination. If you've all read the book 1984 or seen the, uh, the film with John Hurt and Richard Burton, when O'Neill is uh, torturing Winston, at a certain point, he, he lets him off the torture table and uh, Winston hugs him. He embraces him, really embraces him, not ironically, not out of aggression, but out of genuine gratitude. And that's when you know he's being broken. He's being slowly broken. He is grateful to his torturer for the five minute break. Genuinely, tearfully grateful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We've all been there if we've all been in narcissistically abusive relationships. So yeah, that moment of, of sex, which feels like, you know, it's, it's very overwhelming. It's a very, it's a very strong physical sensation. We'll go, oh, there's the love. This is what I was waiting for. So. Yeah, there is that, uh, that element to it. My suggestion would be for people who want to overcome this is it's not really going to be enough to just go into it at the philosophical level. It's actually going to be almost a spiritual shift. So there's a, there's a concept in NLP called um, neurological levels. It's a Diltz's model, right? Robert Diltz's model. So you've got to get to the the deepest level model that you possibly can for reality, which includes how you see love and how you see attachment and how you see the world working. The beliefs that you have now, if you are a codependent, I'm just going to assume that you are, you're self-identifying as one, are the beliefs of a codependent. So your patterns of behavior are the patterns of behavior of a codependent. When you make a cheese sandwich, you make it as a codependent. When you sleep, you sleep codependently. When you brush your teeth, you're doing it codependently. Everything has to change. Everything has to change. And I think when I say spiritual, I, I don't mean like nothing that requires faith, but at the level where you see Jung intersecting with the Vedic texts, where we have to find the true self, we have to individuate, we have to leave tribal consciousness because tribal consciousness is codependency. In order for us to meet and talk, we have to meet in the middle in this false self, which is an inauthentic self. We're not going to be truly, truly authentic in this lifetime, I don't think, unless you leave society and go and live up a mountain and chant, but you can move towards it. I think the idea is to move towards it, move across that spectrum. Hey folks, just a quick message to let you know, if you're enjoying this talk and you'd like to learn more about overcoming codependency yourself, we have the new course called Summoning the Self, which is out now and it's available from this link up here and realize when you're behaving codependently, realize when you're overgiving. So are you all aware when you're, when you're fawning? Does everybody know when they're fawning? Do you get the feeling when you're making a fawn decision? So some heads nodding. One of the routes to get into the place that I'm suggesting we can all get to is to become 
more aware of what's going on somatically, what's going on inside your body, what's going on emotionally for you. When the instinct to fawn comes up, there will be a specific feeling that you'll get. You've got to learn it. You've got to learn what that state is, that physical somatic state is and go, ooh, I'm getting the urge to fawn. And there'll be a context. The context will probably be somebody asks you to do something or invites you to offer yourself. Oh, I need shoes. Uh, my shoes are shit. Somebody give me their shoes. And if you get the compulsion to go, I have shoes. My son's shoes would fit you. There are shoes in my car. It's codependency. It's my fucking problem. They're my feet. They're my shoes. It's not your problem. It's not your problem. It really isn't your problem. Do you see how culturally we're moving towards a place where we're saying everybody's problem is our problem? It isn't. It really fucking isn't. And it's not healthy. It's not healthy to say everybody's problem is my problem. Compassion is good. Neurosis, not good. Not good. And acting in false compassion is poison. Total poison. This is a hard concept. These are hard concepts. I didn't like these concepts when I came across them at all. Because I was like, no, nah, man, it's just easy. Just do boundaryless giving. Just love everybody. Give everybody everything all the time if you can. You can't do that. Both parties are poisoned. When you give in a boundaryless way, you're both poisoned by it. The giver and the receiver is poisoned. Some people are like this, what the fuck? <laughs> How can giving be bad? <laughs> I'll do me, you do you as a concept for codependence. So the kids call it staying in your lane. Stay in your lane. I'll stay in my lane, you stay in your lane. If I can help you and it's appropriate, I'll help you. But if, if I get the feeling I must help you, where's that coming from? Oh, mummy, mummy, oh, you must help mummy or she's gonna kick the crap out of you. You must help daddy or else. So if the compulsion is I'm helping you or else, that's a problem, that's a real problem. But yeah, no, it's, uh, it is a good part. That's on the new hand mnemonic, isn't it? From the Fortress uh, tutorial. The, the part of the hand mnemonic, if you don't know it, is to say to yourself, okay, I'm me, you're you. We're two separate entities. You're an adult, I'm an adult. You suffer, guess what? So do I. You suffer, guess what? So does everybody. You need help, guess fucking what? That's the nature of reality. Oh, it hurts, yeah, I know. I fucking know. It doesn't mean we don't help, but, oh, damn, that's appropriate. <laughs> um, it doesn't mean, oh, that means it's time. Um, yeah, time for the hand mnemonic. That, uh, <laughs> it doesn't mean we don't help. It means we don't help from neurosis. And that's hard. It's really hard to distinguish. Would it be good to deliver the idea of boundary helping to social workers? I started out working for the probation service. I was working with mainly with criminals who were drug addicts. So I worked with social services and social workers a lot. And uh, in my entrepreneurialism, I was like, damn, I'm in the wrong trade. So I went out and I just started counseling social workers because I never met one who wasn't depressed. I never met one who wasn't riddled with anxiety and frustrated and bitter, bitter full of bitter codependence, cynics, they become cynics because they enter this system. Oh, we're gonna help people, it's gonna be great. <laughs> you can try, the system punishes you for helping people, almost, almost punishes you for helping people. And the probation service was no better. We didn't help anybody. The only thing we helped in the probation service was we helped a creaking system keep people who should have been in prison out of prison. That was my job. The, like to deal with criminals and keep them out of jail. I had guys who like threatened bus drivers with guns and they were like, well, they need counseling. <laughs> Put them in jail. <laughs> You're supposed to go to jail if you possess a gun without a license. Yeah, but yeah, we know him though. Right, so, so how does this? And, and you know, if, if, you're, if you're in the system and you've seen it, you know it actually works like this. Uh, people get away with insane things in this country, completely insane things. But if they used to be a cop, 
and now he's a, he's a drunk and, you know, oh, he's a good lad, just da, da, da. what the fuck, put him in prison. It doesn't, so yeah, you become, you become cynical. The system doesn't work. So, social work was the worst I saw it. Probation officers, similar. Uh, but yeah, you'll see it in, in nursing as well. I mean, it's, it's almost inevitably what you're going to get is this sentiment. This is not what I signed up for. And you're just made to just keep going and keep going and keep going. Don't look at that. Don't look at that. Don't see that. Don't see that. Don't. What are we doing about that? Nothing. Shut up. Stop making noise or we'll fire you. Or we won't fire you. We'll passive aggressively just stick you in a corner for the next five years of your career until you go crazy. So yeah, it would be good to know within that profession, but it would, they'll never do it because you'd be red pilling the profession. And there was the same thing when I worked in education. Teachers, my God, broken, cynical, angry. <laughs> not what I signed up for. I didn't sign up to entrain, you know, to just shove kids through a fucking meat grinder. I don't think any adult human being signs up for teaching like that, but that's what they do. That's what you, it's all numbers, it's results. It's, there's, there's no kids there. They're just, they're just pieces of data that go into a system. So it's very, very tough. It does attract codependence. And if you're not a codependent, it will make you a codependent. So, we as humans respond massively to the environment. We respond massively to our roles. We change, we adapt. Like if you're a policeman, you'll act this way. If you're a soldier, you do this, you know, this, 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 this. It depends on the role you're given way more than this thing called a personality, which we pretend we have. I mean, I've, I've not seen much evidence for that. I think, you know, we, we are a result of trauma and then we're a result of environment. And what we do is what we're told to do because we're pack animals. That's we're mammals and we survive in packs. So we're very social creatures. Yeah, so the, the solution that I'm sort of touting, so as much as there can be a solution in our lifetimes, which I think we just, we move towards, we move towards it. So you'd be like, I'm less codependent than I was rather than, oh, I'm free of codependency. I mean, I, I, t I told a story a couple of years ago, I was doing a seminar on codependency in, in LA and, um, I was on the flight and somebody had paid for a business class flight and I didn't use the cutlery. I didn't use all the cutlery. I used one piece of cutlery and I didn't undo the napkin because I didn't want the air hostess to have to clean more of the cutlery or to wash the napkin. And then I was like, she's shoving them all inside the machine. <laughs> just use the cutlery. But no, I didn't want to. I felt so much more comfortable just using one fork for every single part. I was like, why, why am I doing this? Why am I doing it? and it's what I consider safe. So if we're gonna do like conscious behavioral change techniques, that's great for like two weeks or a month, but you'll forget and life takes over. We have to be working in the realm of the unconscious and the realm of the unconscious is only concerned with safety. It doesn't really care about anything else but safety. So if you keep doing something, even though you wanna stop it, it's because that thing makes you feel safe and stopping doing it feels dangerous anything. So all your behaviors have positive intent, all of them. Uh, overeating, smoking, drinking, snorting coke, fighting with people in the streets, they, it's all positive intent. Stopping doing it feels more dangerous or is entrained into the system is more dangerous than just to continue doing it. I'm, we're actually in the Q&A section. Are you good to keep going? Cool. Yes, sir. Are addictions related to unresolved trauma in a person? More, more than that. I would go further and say all addiction is codependency. More than trauma. Even in a narcissist? Absolutely, it's codependency. Okay. Yeah, so don't get it twisted, folks. Narcissism is codependency. Yeah. It's 100% co it's codependency. Codependency to the extent that they need other people in order to have their sense of self. So, and they're tremendous foreign responders. They're people pleasers. They please people. Narcissists are people pleasers. Yeah, which. Like well, they play great victims and they're extremely charming. Yeah. So like nobody should have any confusion about they're great at manipulating people. They can turn it on. They can be funny. They can be sexy. They can be threatening. They can be this. They can be that. That's a performance. It's performative. And they're not doing it because they want to. They're like us. They don't have wants. They don't have wants. They don't have a self that has wants. They just respond to the environment and do what they're trained to do. Like we do what we're trained to do. It's not a moral absolution for, for narcissism and what narcissists do. 
But what they're doing is as entrained as codependency. They're entrained into dominance and reaction-seeking behavior. We're entrained into submission and fawning behavior to be pleasing at all times. Is codependency and narcissism an addiction? If so, can you be free from it? It has addictive elements, but it's worse than addiction. It's conditioned. So the difference between an addiction and a conditioned response is with an addiction, if I, if I vape, I'm getting a hit from that. Is it trying to go again? Sorry. It's an alarm. <laughs> I don't know why it's alarming. It's, here, but it's an alarm. <laughs> it's, it's alarming me. Um, <laughs> There's, there's actually a payoff there. So when I snorted Coke, I would get, it worked. That's why I took it. I wasn't like, oh, this is boring. Why am I doing this? It's expensive and it hurts my nose. I was getting high. I liked it. When you're conditioned, there's no high. There's no payoff. You do it because you do it, because that's who you are. That's what you do. So there's an addictive element, which we uh, has been identified as narcissistic supply. So I'm with my girlfriend and then I lull her into a false sense of security. She thinks she's having a good day today, but I know it's her birthday, so I'm gonna remind her about something awful her mom said to her seven years ago, just to, you know, just to suck up the milkshake of her suffering. And that gives me like, oh, I'm, I'm getting high off that. Codependents get a little high every time they give themselves away. And they're like, oh, I'm the most servile servant slave in the room. Look at how slavey I am. This is wonderful. I win the game of servility and they get a little high, we get a little high from that. So there's these addictive cyclical qualities to that. So yeah, if we can address that, we can help ourselves. That's how I deal with my codependency. I'm like, I wanna help that person, why? Because da 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 da, I'm like, that's an addiction. That's weakness, that's cowardice. Let that person grow, let them do their own thing. Yeah, you could help them, but just, just leave them alone. So yes, you're right, and it will ameliorate the symptoms in a codependent, not in a narcissist. Because if you say to a narcissist, you're an addict, they'll just re reinterpret what you're saying to, how can I dominate you based on what you're saying? Oh, you want to offer me therapy? Great. Yeah, no, you know, I always thought I was an addict. Why don't we talk about that a while so I can drink your milkshake later? The wrestling match with a codependent is still tough because they'll hold on to their codependency and say, no, this is kindness or this is my religion. I have it with uh, Christian codependents or, or Buddhist codependents. Like, no, 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 this is, we give, we're selfless. I'm like, this is not, this is not your faith. This is neurosis. If you're choosing to do it from consciousness, that's faith. If you're doing it from neurosis, that's trauma. You're just, you're just a traumatized addict who's fiending for uh, their, like, their high. So there, is, there are those elements to it, but it should be understood overall as a conditioned response far harder like to be honest with you as far as i'm aware psychologists we don't really know how to break condition responses uh, this is what i this is my life i try to break condition responses and if you ask me how i will jokingly say i want to throw everybody into a mind control gulag wink i'm not joking if you really want to be reconditioned i need you for months in total control i, I control when you get up when you eat, what you do during the day. I don't think I need to torture you, but I do think you need to feel like I don't know when I'm gonna be able to leave because I need you to regress into an infantile state and see me as a complete tyrant, like Joe Stalin. You know, the people in the, gula in the gulags, they would write birthday letters to Joseph Stalin. Thank you, Mr. Stalin, thank you. They're in gulags, they're starving to death. And they would sincerely say, thank you, comrade Stalin. They would mean it. That's what I would need to do to you. I need to gulag you and then recondition you because I have to break the ego boundaries down to the point where you are infantilized and I think I would get to your neuroplasticity then. I think, but I don't know. And every time I try and set it up, the police are like, you can't do that, <laughs> human rights, <laughs> fuck off. So yeah, you had your hand up, sir. Would you ironically start helping the narcissist if you started playing the game? You're either giving them what they want or you're not. So when you get discarded, people are like, why did I get discarded? And I'm like, I can give you the truth, but it's going to hurt your feelings. If you weren't discarded three cycles back and this time you were, you're just not giving them what they want anymore. And they found another source. It's real simple. Sam Vaknin said it to me once on a seminar and it really hurt my feelings. He said, <laughs> he said that your narcissistic ex-girlfriend sees you 
with as much passion as she views a lawnmower or a vacuum cleaner. I was like, fuck, dude. Dude, <laughs> like, this is not how friends talk to each other. Come on, sugarcoat it a little bit. He was like, no, it's meaningless. You're, the lawnmower breaks, I got a new lawnmower. You're done. You're done. You're a, you're, you are not a person. They're not a person either. They're not a, they're, they don't see themselves as a human being with vulnerabilities. You're not seen as a human being. They don't believe in humanity. They don't really believe in the intersubjective agreement. They don't really see you as having, I have a soul, you have a soul, I have fears and needs and wants, and so do you. That doesn't exist for them. So you're either giving me what I want or you're done. So yeah, no, I don't think that would help them, unfortunately. <laughs> There's not, I'm not hopeful with true MPD at all. Not at all. How can you manage a relationship with a narcissist? I manage it. It's a managed relationship. So I always loved the book Silence of the Lambs as a kid. And everybody focuses on uh, Hannibal Lecter and on Clarice Starling because they're the protagonists. But they forget about Barney. Barney was a smart guy. He actually had Dr. Lecter's respect. He genuinely respected him. Yeah, whoa, wait, whoa there, whoa there, Trigger. Okay, le le okay let me help you, let, let me help you, let me help you. I can manage a relationship with Sam Vaknin. Don't any of you ever try it. Don't any of you ever try it. <laughs> Don't try it. Don't try it. It's, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not a smart, not gonna be a smart thing to do. You, you can, you can send them emails. If you're very polite, then, then you, you mean in your life with narcissists? No, no, no. Sam, listen, uh, all joking aside, Sam, Sam Batnin is not just NPD. There is, there are, th there's many things going on there. He is NPD and he is a genuine psychopath. There are other issues there as well. He also has a very, very high IQ and a very high degree of awareness. So it can be navigated and negotiated, but don't look at that and think it means that you can have relationships with narcissists or friendships with narcissists. Can moving to a new country, having to learn a new language, reduce a person to an infantile state and therefore lead to a narcissist codependent dynamic in an international couple? I think I have mentioned it on YouTube before. I should talk about it more. It's like over 90% of my clients, it's cultural and racial difference and or age and or age difference. So, if you're in the field of psychology and you want to work backwards, there's a fallacy that we have to be careful of, which is um, com hoc ergo propter hoc, which means with this, therefore, because of this. So you say, well, this keeps happening in 90% of cases. Why is it happening? I actually now think it's just because, like, why, like, why did I, I haven't dated a white English woman in 20 years. Why? because my mother's a white English woman and that's where the abuse came from. <laughs> so, so when people go and live in foreign countries and they move very, very far away, I'm almost, I, I wanna come up with a hypothesis where I can grade how bad your childhood trauma is by how far around the world you go. <laughs> like, are you, are you like Croatia? Are you Russia or are you Japan? Because that's why, you know, they'll, they'll, people will and it's like, um, it's like the explosion of childhood, and then we'll go all the way out. So I think that's, that's probably what it is. Also, narcissism is served by massive cultural and linguistic differences. So if, there's, if you have people of two different ethnicities, but they're both from Liverpool, it's not going to make any difference. Because the, the binding culture here is so strong, like if they've grown up here, it's, it, it, it won't make, it's not going to do anything. The difference is significant different cultural coordinates significantly different cultural coordinates. So as I'm abusing you, you have to be able to say, oh, it's because he's from the Wirral and they're a bit that way over there, you know. <laughs> he's, from, he's from the fucking Wirral, you know. Or wherever, or he's from Germany, or he's from Australia, or he's from wherever. There's a slew of clients I've got in Australia who hate Brits. They think all Brits are narcissists. And that went on for years and I was like, what the fuck, what are we doing? But we're going to Australia, so you have people in their 20s, young men and women, they go there for work, they go there to party, they shag a couple of Australians, and then what do they do? They fuck off and leave them. And there's something in our culture, English culture, because we are, if you look at the promiscuity levels, we're one of the most promiscuous countries in the world by a long way. So we're extremely promiscuous. The way we do attachment is different. So the Australian sense of 
what this means <laughs> and our sense of what this means is so different that they think Brit they're just like, well, British people are just narcissists. They use you and then they leave. So these different cultural coordinates can cause, can cause real trouble. And they, they do cover narcissistic abuse as well. Like if I can say to you, oh, it's because that's what we do on the Wirral, you'd have to go, well, I suppose that's what you do on the Wirral then. Fucking weirdos. <laughs> Could it be because of the most damaged people that they Australia? I think there's that as well. I think it's, I, honestly, I really do. I really do. I think like, look at people who study psychology. The fucking, yeah. There's a lot of damaged people in psychology. There's a lot of people in the, hel in the helping professions who are damaged. Teachers. Teachers, uh, spirituality. If you go into the yoga, spirituality, what are musicians like? Well, there's two different ways, isn't there? Because there are the people who go into something with the dream of doing something, uh, whether it be nursing or teaching or, or being a policeman or being some kind of positive influence, and then the dream gets broken and there it creeps in. And then there are the sort of more, the people who are all already more predatory mm. and they go into music or into... <clears throat> teaching or nursing or whatever and they've actually got a little mission in there mm, you know? and mm, mm. It, de it depends where you you know where have you where have you gone into it but yeah for, with music mm. there's a hell of a lot of people now that i see from you know now i've spent five or six years trying to figure out psychology mm. i thought why the bloody hell am i doing this you know? yeah yeah but that was about four years ago now i'm like right i know why i'm doing this now. yeah um, yeah but it's, yeah, I it's still there are a hell of a lot of musicians. It's still a people-pleasing activity, isn't it? It's performative. It's huge people. And why did you ever get into it? You yeah. were probably pleasing people in your family. Yeah. And, I, you know, I'm really, I'm, I'm really averse. If somebody asks me to perform, I am so, like, yeah. hair stand on end. I don't know what it is. It's yeah. like, but then again, it's, it's my job. So it's like, what's up? Yeah, it's your job. You get up and do it all the time. Yeah. Just don't yeah. ask me to do it. Yeah. Do you want a song? Yeah. <laughs> Was that a hand up at the back there? Oh, no. You're just stretching. <laughs> yeah. Is there a link between autism and NPD? <sighs> Sam Backnan's your man for that, uh, to, to, to explain that. I don't know what autism is. <laughs> I'm not going to say much more than that. There are, there, are, there are buckets, they're like defining buckets that people get chucked into. We do pathologize, like generally we live in a place where we're, we're pathologizing an awful lot. I, when I, wor I worked in the education system for five years and I'd be showing people, I was told they had this, that, the other thing, all these different labels. And I was like, I think, um, I think what this person has is they're a bored teenager and you're boring the piss out of them and they hate this schoolwork. And I think that's why, you know, there are genuine conditions that get called autism, but then there are other things that are given that blanket term. And I'm like, what are we, what are we talking about? What, 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 what do you mean? And even people who specialize in autism, they don't all agree what the, what the exact boundaries are, but there, I know why you're asking the question because there's this sort of association between autism and an inability to understand metacommunication as it was uh, defined with Asperger syndrome and autism and this strange sense of talking to artificial intelligence when you're talking to somebody who's autistic and so that then that became oh maybe it's maybe it's the same thing I don't know I really I really don't know I've lived with people who've been diagnosed uh, autistic and I've seen them like both of them were men both of them worked in tech and I saw how they interacted with their girlfriends and I was like bloody hell you know I'd even say to them you know when you want to hug your girlfriend or show your girlfriend affection can you not do it with your foot you know can you not stroke your girlfriend with your foot and he went, why what's the problem with that and I'm like oh because <laughs> It doesn't really convey what you think it does. It, you know, th this, this kind of conversation would go on. There is, there's something. Asperger syndrome, I was more convinced by because I live, I've seen it and it's, it has this, a cluster of behaviors that seems to be semi-permanent across time and context. But a lot of other conditions that are called autism, I'm like, how are these, why, why is that autism? And this also has been called autism. Do you know what I mean? There are definitely going to be NPD people who have Asperger syndrome. These are not viruses that we can put under a microscope. These are just words that psychologists write in a book. So 
if you write a really like we were saying about artwork before how does how is artwork rated well if you can describe your artwork as being like oh this represents my childhood trauma and my fight against blah, 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 you get a better grade than if you go is a picture of me foot it's half a literary exercise so if you wanted to say that you've uncovered some new condition in kids if you wrote a really good book about it some people would accept it they go yeah there's a new condition now It'll get your name and you'll be dead famous and popular and are people more mentally ill now than they were 50 years ago i don't think that we're going to be like more mentally ill than like the romans were i don't think that we're more mentally ill than we were pre-world war one but i think what i would say is uh we're under more pressure we are under more information overload and the, the statement I made earlier about late stage consumer capitalism isn't really a flippant one. We really are at the end of something here. Like I had this thought today, um, you know, when you go on public transport or if you've ever been in a city and you go around the city and you go on public transport and you're trying to get from one side of town to the other, you're forced, forced to read other people's words. You know, as a human being, if I put up the word, uh, if, I, if I show you an, an innocent smoothie, you can't not say innocent smoothie in your head. I can make you say it, innocent fucking smoothie. Like, why is he swearing? Innocent fucking smoothie. So whenever you see a, a billboard, you, you, you're like, Laborman investments for my future. And then you read the thing and it says, don't put the feet on the seat. And then you're like, where do I escape this fucking stim? There's too much, way too much information, way too much stimulation, too much choice. Something that Sam told me that he'd uh, gotten from another book was, wait, we do more in a day than a feudal peasant would have done in a lifetime. It's, it's really stressful. It's really, really stressful. So th this environment that we're in is um, massively inhumane. It's, a mass it's an anti-human environment. And so are we more mentally ill I don't know. We're definitely more stressed. Binding, comforting story you can live by now. We, at least when we were dumb peasants, we could believe in like whatever, whatever the faith was of the country that you're in or whatever your feudal lords tell you is reality. You go, oh, phew, whew, somebody's in charge. Now you know nobody's in charge. You know exactly because the people who are in charge are tweeting whilst they take a shit. So we know exactly how fucking stupid and mad they are. It's frightening for us. We're like... Well, who's, who's, in who's running this then? Who's in charge? If nobody's in charge, do you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's stressful. But I wouldn't say we're more narcissistic than the Romans or we're more narcissistic than the Celts or the Greeks or probably not, probably not. We've probably always been fairly shitty. <laughs> any, other, any other questions? Why can't I condemn my narcissistic girlfriend? Why do I pull away instead? here you're running from some truth that you're frightened of yeah. so you won't say that to her because of some truth that you're frightened of some secret some burden that you're carrying that you've been carrying for a long time and only if we go into that radical acceptance space of every part of the story and everything that's happened then you'll you'll know why then you'll be able to say why uh, you can't tell her the truth, why it's a taboo to just say to her, this is who you are and this is what you're doing and I don't care what you do with this information. Mummy, I mean, you're not my mummy. <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> <laughs> Mother! So this is something I need to overcome to get to a point where I can hold someone accountable. Yeah, I think codependency it's, 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 it's codependency. In, in your case, what I would advise you do is explore that which is hidden. Okay. Explore that which you're holding that you're ashamed of. So you're holding stuff, you're like, you're protecting her. So. Precisely. Okay. And I can't get my head around why I do that every time. Yeah, because you're still protecting your mother and saying she did her best. She didn't mean to brand me with the iron. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's that. I don't know if it's that. Well, my mum passed away when I was 20 months old, but my dad is a pathological narcissist. So it could be. So are you protecting mother or father? He got with a narcissistic woman when I was three, had another kid with her straight away. So right. from three to 11, I was neglected by her because she wouldn't talk to me in my own house. Okay, so the great truth and the great pain that we're avoiding is... Total to, neglect. Yeah, total neglect. Beyond neglect, it's rejection, which is worse Absolutely. than neglect. So that's the pain that we're trying to run away from and we're trying to avoid again. 
what if she rejects you? What if she abandons you? But I think if you can, if you can work through that emotionally, you wouldn't have a problem. It's, it's really, it's never them. It's never them. They don't have the power. Like, this is why I hate narcissistic for, uh, narcissism forums. It's a bunch of people getting together going, oh my God, they're so powerful and sexy and beautiful. <laughs> no, no, they're not. They're a bunch of knobs. A bunch of cheap fucking swindlers. You go on these narcissism forums and they're like, you wouldn't believe it. My ex, he looks like Sean Connery. I'm like, show us a picture of him. I'm like, what fucking version of Sean Connery is that? He's a twat with a ponytail. Get the fuck, get the fuck, get out of there. Um, and I've heard that multiple times. My, my ex looks like Angelina Jolie, my ex. And it's, what, what's that? That's our infantile projection. They're some famous superstar. They're so wonderful. They're this, they're that. It's, they're not. They're not. They're not mummy. They're not daddy. That's, we're still putting people on pedestals. We're still looking up high and going, wow, you're so powerful. No, they're not. No, they're not. We're doing that. It's always us. It's always us that's given that power away. Not through consent, it's uh, the conditioned thing that I said before, it's an unconscious conditioned response. Last question, we'll take a break, yep. Saying the narcissist instead of my narcissist. Yeah, it's, it's, like a, it's like a perverse sort of dyad that we're in, you know, the trauma bonding thing where you get to the point where you're protecting the person who's abusing you is because of shame, but you won't know what you're ashamed of, you go, like, why? Why do I feel so much sh like it's boundaryless shame? It's the shame of a child. So you felt ashamed yeah. instead of you should have felt angry. Yeah, I couldn't bring myself to be angry because yeah. like I, I would like be well. I'm a guy. Yeah, I don't want to tear her apart. I've got kids. I don't want to go to jail. I but don't it, want to lose it. But it happened when you were so young that anger and the fight response wasn't an option. Yeah. So if you're young enough or terrified enough, the awful things I do to you, you will think you're doing. Does that make sense? It's like some weird psychoanalytic shit. So when you're very, very young and very small and you see mummy and daddy fighting, you, you're not saying, ah, oh, the external object of my mother has had a bad day. You're just like, bad thing happen. Me, bad, feel bad, bad thing, me, me, bad thing, thing. It's a totally solipsistic and therefore narcissistic point of view that we come from. So we are fused with our partners. This is why we don't, this is why I make the claim we never know love. We've never known love. Well, that isn't love, is it? No, it's fusing. We're merging with people. I'm lonely. Let me merge with you. Ugh. <laughs> it's disgusting. <laughs> there was a film in the 80s, a horror film called Society. Did any of you ever see it? It was, it was this really gross horror film. But the rich people feed off the poor by fusing with them. So they actually blend with them and absorb in this gross, it's really awful special effects. It's laughably awful special effects, but they kind of have an orgy with the poor people and then they meld with them and they absorb them and they get stuck. They're physically stuck into them by fusing and merging. And with that lovely image, I'd like you all take a break. Please don't wander off and go upstairs or anywhere. Thank you guys. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed that talk. Um, if you want to learn more about overcoming codependency, the new course called Summoning the Self is available from this link up here. Thank you.